Hi, everybody. This is Kathy L. Murphy, the Pulpwood Queen, reporting from our Saturday afternoon. We have three keynotes back to back as we begin this afternoon. And I have never been more thrilled because uh, our next author is coming back after winning our bonus book of the year last year, Michael Ferris Smith. And his, does he have a great new book? But we're getting everybody in. And we want you to chat in the chat space. And then if we have any time at the very end, we will open up for questions. If not, at the very end, I'm going to ask you, Michael, to share your contact information. He will also be back later today to help give the awards. He's going to be passing on the torch for the Pulpwood Bonus Book of the Year to our next winner. And she will be here. So I, and you've got all that information, Michael, if, or we'll talk. Okay, so here we go, everybody. Um, Michael Ferris Smith came into my uh, view by authors. And when authors tell me that a, a, a book is important, I pay attention because authors are tremendous readers. And there was a new voice that was getting a lot of buzz. And so I checked it out and he came and lo and behold, his book won our bonus book of the year last year. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Michael Ferris Smith who has a book that will it's going to hit the ceiling, you all. This is a book I've waited for my entire life, ever since I've been reading Fitzgerald. So go ahead, Michael, kick it off. Thank you, Kathy. And hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. And uh, yeah, what Kathy said, I'm, I'm going to talk and um, share some things, but also feel free to ask questions, uh, pop them up in the chat or however we're going to do this at any time because, uh, you know, the sound of my own voice gets a little boring to me. So I like to share, kind of do it back and forth with everyone. So feel free to hop in and ask questions. Um, and whatever it is uh, you want to talk about, we'll talk about concerning Nick. Um, I, re I realize sitting here now, hold it, Robert's holding it up. I don't have a copy of it with me. How did you here. get a copy of that, Robert? I'm so waiting. Oh my <laughs> gosh, you have connections. No, it's a, you should be able to get it. It's uh, January 5th was the release date. And so it's been out about a week and a half and it's been very exciting, very fun. Um, I'm going to like share with you how I came to write the backstory of Nick Carraway um, here in a minute with this uh, little essay piece I wrote as um, this is actually the UK edition of The Great Gatsby from one of their publishers. Uh, and it's the same, my same publisher who's publishing Nick in the UK. And so I wrote the forward uh, for this, um, which I'm going to share with you a little bit, which kind of explains it better than I can explain it on the fly. But yeah, Nick came out, I guess about 10 days ago. Um, wow. It's been a lot of fun. It's been very interesting. And for you book clubbers, if you will check out my website, michaelferrismith.com, there is a reading guide. There's a tab for book clubs. Um, for reading guides for all of my books, but we also have a brand new um, reading guide for Nick that's been put up in the last week or so. So that's there also. So I think the easiest thing for me to do is I wrote this essay called The End of the Menacing Road, which is essentially, you know, four pages about how I kind of came to, to this story and why I kind of was crazy enough to try, try it and do it. Um, but I'm just going to read it. It's, it's short. And then after that, you know, we can answer questions. We can talk a little more about it. But um, I thought this would be the most specific way to it. I had read The Great Gatsby a couple of times during my 20s. The first time I read it, I was in college and my reaction was almost no reaction. I was a bored and uninterested student. And I'm not sure anything less than a lightning bolt striking the classroom would have caught my attention. I even remember thinking... What is the big deal? The second time I read it, I was living in Geneva, Switzerland in the midst of spending an unexpected few years as an expatriate. It was a brave new world, one that I loved right away, one that I embraced, one that I wanted to hold on to and never let go, though I knew a return home to Mississippi was inevitable. On this second reading in my late twenties, I began to notice things in Nick Carraway, the story's narrator, that I found in myself. Uncertainty about where he belonged, but trying to figure it out. Shifting ideas about notions of home and country, 
a curiosity about the people who surrounded him that often fell into confusion and vagueness. Was it possible I could relate to Nick Carraway? Fast forward another 14 years to the next time I picked up The Great Gatsby. I'm not even sure why I picked it up other than I was looking for something shorter to read and I saw it there on my shelf and I had mostly forgotten about it. So I decided to sit down and see if it awakened anything in me that might have been lost <laughs> over the years. It was one of the most surreal reading experiences of my life. It seemed as if there was something on every page that spoke to me, that related to my own experiences, that spoke to my own and still very alive thirst for the unknown. The further I moved into the novel, the more at home I felt in it. And then getting closer to the end, I came across this line. I was 30, before me stretched the portentous menacing road of a new decade. Only a few lines earlier, Nick has just remembered that it is his birthday, as if to remind himself that he exists, that he is alive. The portentous menacing road of a new decade rang in my head again and again. I closed the book right there and put it down and could only think about my own life when I was close to turning 30. I was 29 years old when I came home from Europe and I came back to a hometown I did not recognize. My parents no longer lived there. My sisters were gone and starting families and careers in other places. During the time I had been gone, my friends had done things like get married, have children, buy houses, get jobs, get promotions. And here I was sleeping on somebody's couch with all I own stuffed into a couple of duffel bags. It was strange, not just because of what they had all become, but because of what I had become. Somewhere along the way, I had decided I wanted to try and write. I had spent years reading as I sat in the cafes in France, as I sat in my apartment in Geneva, as I traveled on the train from one country to another and something had moved inside of me. It's difficult to explain or define. All I knew was that when I got back to Mississippi, I was going to write and I wasn't even sure what that meant. So there I was, 29 years old, on the verge of turning 30, with the uncertainty of a new decade before me, with my attitudes about, about self and place drastically different than they had been when the decade of my 20s began, with this urge to try and write, with home and the people I knew all colored in different shades. It felt as though I was standing on the edge of a canyon, a strong wind at my back, and that if I stepped over the edge, I would either be crushed on the jagged rock below or I would be lifted and carried by the wind. It was indeed a menacing road before me, full of doubt. As I sat there with Gatsby closed, thinking about Nick's notions of turning 30, the decade of my own 30s ran through my mind. I did begin to write and it was difficult. I got married. I enrolled in and finished a writing program. I began submitting stories and received a pile of rejection until I finally published a few. We moved, I kept writing, I kept getting rejected. My wife got pregnant. I tried to write a novel and it didn't work. I tried to write another one and it didn't work. I wrote a novella, we had a baby girl, we moved again, I got depressed, I kept writing. I got depressed again, my wife got pregnant again. I started another novel and nobody wanted any of it. I kept writing. We had another baby girl. I was going to be turning 40 soon. I kept writing and kept getting rejected and kept getting depressed and tried to keep my head above water, waiting for something to happen. It did, but not until I was 40. My novella was accepted. A year later, my first novel was accepted. I realized then that the decade of my 30s had to be an evolution. It had to be the metamorphosis. I didn't know it while I was going through it, but Nick Carraway had known what it was going to be like. He had known it was going to be unpredictable, an emotional whirlwind, a decade of challenge. I opened Gatsby again and finished it, but from that moment, the character of Nick Carraway lived in my imagination and I began to consider him from different angles. But he admits almost nothing about himself in Gatsby. I realized I only knew three things about him. He fought in the Great War, he was from the Midwest, and he was turning 30. That was it. 
for someone who I thought I found great camaraderie with, I didn't know anything about him at all. And the simple thought occurred to me, it would be interesting if someone were to write his story. Almost before I could finish the thought, I knew that someone would be me. I shared his feelings of isolation, of bewilderment. I had lived the expatriate life like Fitzgerald and the other writers of the lost generation, all of who had a profound impact on both my writing life and emotional life. I was a writer filled with an idea that excited me and propelled me, which is really the only criteria I have for a project I want to work on. I realized the gravity of it all, the weight of its literary heft, but I could not stop thinking about it, which meant I had to write it. So I did. It's impossible to know what is going to grab hold of you. I think back to the first time I read The Great Gatsby and I only shrug my shoulders. I think back to the second time I read it and I begin to feel its emotion and truth. And then I think about how the third time I read it and how it changed me, how it became a part of me, how it made me realize that you can face a portentous menacing road of a new decade and you can survive and come out on the other end of it reborn because the edge of a new decade means you are alive. It means you are on the edge of experiences and emotions you cannot yet understand. It may be a decade of loneliness as Nick predicts, but that loneliness may also manifest itself into the wind that carries you. Thank you, that's it. Kathy, are you talking to me? You need to unmute if you're talking to me. I see you talking. Yep, I'm sorry. I, I said, I, we've heard you speak a couple of times, but I didn't realize um, the challenges. And I think that's very important that you talk about that because I think a lot of times too many people give up yeah. and life gets in the way. I mean, I'm, I'm a trooper. I never give up. I mean, it took me 43 years to get through college, seven universities, but I did it because I was determined and right. I never give up. But uh, what do you think that kept you going? What was it inside of you that gave you that, um, you know, persistence? Um, there's probably a few things that really impact me. One was it was the first time in my life I had really felt passionate about anything. Uh, you know, I'd knocked around, I'd worked a hundred different odd jobs. I'd been an athlete growing up and that's all I really cared about was playing ball and then spent my twenties just living here and there and moving around. And <clears throat> I don't know why it struck me that I wanted to write. Well, I know why, because after years of reading, I just felt something kind of change in me and living abroad, I had that big impact. But coming home at 29 or 30, I, I just felt like passionate about something for the first time really in my life I think I'm always amazed by people who know what they want to do when they're 18 years old or 22 or whatever I mean just that was so alien to me and then the other thing that really helped me in, and influenced me was I discovered the writer Larry Brown who's from Oxford Mississippi who was 29 years old when he, he started writing I mean I started reading his interviews when I became familiar with his work he was 29 and he had been a blue collar guy worked a lot of ton of jobs and he just was in love with it and wanted to do it and he believed if he worked hard enough that something would happen that it would happen and that was a great inspiration to me because he was from Mississippi I think he and I were very similar in our backgrounds and the way we had come to it and I saw in that, that there was possibility to do 